Okay, now, in Jewish tradition, this common literary practice involved inventing stories about characters, biblical characters, heroes, rabbis, holy men, and so on. This practice of creative storytelling is not, as some Christians or some conservative Christians have suggested, to be equated with lying or a lack of morality. People were more than happy to make up stories about other people and events and did so as they saw fit. More generally, this kind of rewriting of history is everywhere in the ancient world. And there is plenty of evidence that the first Christians were immersed in the world of creative storytelling that had minimal grounding in history. Now, statistically speaking, you might think that the telling of fictional stories would have to be part of the Gospels. They do, after all, talk about their own hero, Jesus. And passages you might judge to be creative writing might include, I don't know, stories like miracles, resurrected people, eating with people, walking through walls kind of thing. You might think that they are invented stories. I'll leave that open for now. Okay. In fact, we have one relevant passage, which is, I think, quite obviously a human invention. And this is Matthew chapter 27 verses 52 to 53. And this is what it says. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, after Jesus' resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now, my favourite attempt to avoid the blindingly obvious is by the ultra-conservative Bishop of Durham, N.T. Wright. He says, some stories are so odd they may just have happened. This may be one of them. But in historical terms, there's no way of finding out. Hmm. Words like Elvis, fairies, vampires and zombies certainly spring to mind. And it does make you wonder what kind of critical history is left uh, in light of such comments. And it gives you some insight into the strange nature of the discipline. Now, there are good reasons other than this being a story about several people rising from the dead to believe that it didn't happen. It's not found in Mark. You'd think that Mark might have recorded such a stunningly spectacular event if it had happened. You'd hardly be ignorant of it. The story is not mentioned elsewhere in the Gospels. Why? Why isn't it mentioned? The story of dead people rising from tombs is not found in the work of the first century Jewish historian Josephus. He knew of countless events in Jerusalem wrote millions of these things down and it really would have been bizarre if he admitted this pretty spectacular story if it had happened now think of this in terms of a discussion between Josephus and his scribe okay well Josephus let's include a story about two teachers tearing down the decorations of the temple we'll have to include the story of the Romans sacking Jerusalem and destroying the temple oh we better include that story about those dead people rising from tombs haven't we isn't it the most spectacular thing you've ever heard Josephus no. no. It's not that good. I think they'll find my witty accounts of the political wranglings in Jerusalem more than stimulating. Um, I mean, come on. This would not be omitted in any historical account if it had happened. The other argument against is that according to Jewish views on bodily resurrection, as outlined by Wright, these dead saints would probably have to be alive today. So, where are they? I don't know. Okay? Stand if you Okay. But seriously, a key point is that we have a very good piece of evidence that the first Christians were inventing stories about bodily resurrection. Very good example, I think. And that alone should warn us that the resurrection stories could involve rewriting of history. Now, Dr. Crossley says, but look at uh, certain things in the Gospels that are clearly fictional and non-historical. And he gives the example of the resurrection of the saints. But as Dale Allison points out in his response to an article by Professor Crossley on this, admitting that there are legendary elements in the Gospels, for example, the resurrection of the saints, does nothing to undermine the remaining testimony of the Gospels to things like the crucifixion of Jesus, the empty tomb, the resurrection appearances. You can't treat the Gospels with so blunt an instrument of that if you're going to do significant historical work. Question, I think, to Professor Craig. 
Um, who would like to kick off? There's someone in the middle over there in the brownish shirt. We have to wait for the microphones to come. Oh, hi. Um, the Matthew 27 account seems to be problematic to you. You made the point you don't have to believe it to believe the resurrection. So I want to ask, do you believe it? Why do you believe it? And what happens to the dead people, um, as Mr. Crossley suggested, and the lack of Josephus' evidence? Right. Well? I don't know what to think about this uh, passage. Actually, I think that on Dr. Crossley's view, he ought to take it as historical because it's very easy to understand how a community that believed that Jesus of Nazareth was risen from the dead uh, and, and therefore hallucinated visions of him might have a whole chain of hallucinatory experiences of seeing Old Testament saints ri risen from the dead and that Matthew then reports this fact that uh, people in the city saw these Old Testament saints and uh, they appeared to them. So it would be very easy on his hypothesis to think of this as being uh, an historical account of what people in Jerusalem experienced. I'm not sure what to think. It, um, my, my reservation is that it could be part of the apocalyptic imagery of Matthew, which isn't meant to be taken in a literal way. That. Uh, this would be part of the typical sort of apocalyptic symbolism to show the earth-shattering nature of the resurrection and the need to be taken historically, literally. But the one thing that I want to uh, close with on commenting on this is note that this is not attached to a resurrection narrative. This story about the Old Testament saints is attached to the crucifixion narrative. So that if you try to say that because Matthew has this unhistorical element in his crucifixion account, that therefore the whole account is worthless, you would be led to deny the crucifixion of Jesus, which is one indisputable fact that everyone recognizes about the historical Jesus. So it really doesn't have any implications for the historicity of the burial story, the empty tomb story, or the appearance accounts. It's connected to the crucifixion narrative. Thank you, Professor Craig. Um, Jerry? Uh, yeah. um, well, uh, shifting it over to me. I mean, that's, come on. Um, what is this vision? Well, I doubt it. Nobody else records this story, just Matthew. Um, tying it to the crucifixion is meaningless. I mean, it just, all it shows is that we know people make up stories about resurrection. That's what this story shows, which we know that the first Christians could invent a story about resurrection and therefore we might want to see if there are other reasons behind you know why they could have invented other stories about resurrection perhaps but still uh, I just uh, I, I mean it really uh, it just shows that people can make up these stories and that they were making up stories about bodily resurrection I mean that's the key point thank you very much